Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Golden Eagle Audubon's class, Stop the Funk. It was kind of a gruesome, uh, gruesome title, but it is really true. I mean, and, and we all kind of, you know, cringe because it'd be surprising for somebody to not have been in a building when a I bird hit the window. Um, I'm Liz Paul. I'm the program coordinator for mm -hmm. Golden Eagle Audubon. We have a huge number of people signed up for this class this evening, and that uh, we're really, really glad that we're able to offer it. Um, remember to keep your audio and your video off. We're not going to be able to have a conversation between us, but um, we are, the, the chat is open. You could chat with each other and you can chat to us. And we're going to want your questions to come in on the chat, and we will be taking the questions at the end. We are recording this and we'll make this available on the Golden Eagle Audubon YouTube channel and you'll be able to see it and share it and encourage other people to watch it. We hope you do. We uh, very much want people to, uh, to learn about this topic and that's why we're really excited for our speaker tonight. Now, if you, um, if this, this may be your first um, class or program with Golden Eagle Audubon, and we are the local chapter for Southwest Idaho of the National Audubon Society. We just celebrated our 50th year. Our organization was founded in 1972. Uh, isn't that incredible? And um, has accomplished so many things over those 50 years. And you can visit our website, goldeneagleaudubon.org, to look at our events calendar. We have educational programs. We've got a lot of volunteer opportunities. We have um, um, a lot of field trips. We've got um, a lot of things going on. We are uh, going to be um, uh, doing a get out and bird event from mid-May into June, where we're gonna be putting on extra field trips. So if you haven't been on one of our field trips, maybe you tried to and haven't been able to get in, we're hoping that this will be an opportunity for everybody to be able to, be, to, be able to get on a field trip. Um, but I really wanna invite everybody to consider joining our chapter, joining Golden Eagle Audubon, um, our membership fees are, uh, are, are very reasonable, and you can join on that webpage again, goldeneagleaudubon.org. Um, and it, it supports our work. We couldn't do our work without support from all of you that are interested and concerned about birds. So, um, Again, this is Golden Eagle Audubon. This is our class, Stop the Thunk. Um, so let me just talk a little bit about um, uh, one of the reasons that we're interested that we are hosting this class. And um, there are a number of buildings in our area that are notorious bird killers. And this came to the attention of our organization you know, years ago. And there has been monitoring done by the volunteers. And, um, and we also get called upon by um, both individuals who are concerned from at their homes, but also from um, um, public buildings, private buildings. Um, nobody really wants to have a bunch of dead birds laying outside their, um, their doors when they get there in the morning type of thing. So um, we are working to put together um, um, a team that's gonna be working on this and uh, having, uh, one of our first events is going to be at the Raptor Fest on June 3rd, and we want to have uh, information about um, window collisions and preventing window collisions there. And we need a team of folks to um, help us uh, put that display together and also be at the Raptor Fest to talk to other people about it. So at the end of this, I'm going to ask for uh, people to, uh, you know, I'm looking for volunteers tonight. That's one of the reasons that we're doing this. All right. So without further ado, hopefully everybody's in and um, definitely put in the chat if you are having um, issues or need any help from us, um, put it to everybody uh, 
I can't read the chat and answer, but we've got Cynthia Wallace, our director, who's monitoring the chat right now. All right, so our speaker tonight is Caitlin Parkins, and she is with uh, a national organization called the American Bird Conservancy. Pretty cute little acronym, ABC. And Caitlin, um, Caitlin has worked for 10 years on um, the, the, the serious problem of bird collisions and bird fatalities from running into windows. She is their glass collision program coordinator. And that might not sound like a lot, but once she tells you all the things they're doing, it's, it's amazing what they're doing. Um, she is coming to us from Denver, Colorado, but she has spent a lot of time in New York City, where she, or New York State anyway, where she um, was instrumental and helping uh, volunteers and activists uh, get some legislation passed for bird-friendly windows. Um, so her program, they work on multiple fronts. They work on legislation, they work on improvement of glass products, then uh, they do a lot of education. So without further ado, Caitlin's gonna share her screen and we're gonna get turn our program over to her this evening. Welcome Caitlin and thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I just want to make sure you can see my screen up there. Does that look right to you? It looks awesome. Awesome. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, um, for joining. Um, please, as I present this evening, put your questions in the chat. Um, oftentimes, you know, you might have a question that I'll end up answering a little bit later in the program, but we'll have lots of time at the end for me to get to all of those. Um, as well as provide you with some uh, website links for more resources. So I'm going to share a ton of information. Don't worry about, uh, you know, scribbling it all down right now. Uh, we'll have lots of resources for you at the end as well. So let's get started. Let me see. Here we go. All right. So um, I wanted to start out today and let me just see if I can get the chat up here. I just really like to be able to see the chat while I'm presenting. There we go. Um, okay. Um, so I wanna make sure at first that we're all on the same page about window collisions, a little bit about why they happen, um, and then we'll get into how we can prevent them both in our homes and within our communities. So, First, there are two different types of collisions, um, and you've probably experienced both before. Um, the first, which is depicted by this male cardinal fluttering at a window here on the right, is a territorial aggression type of collision. This is when a bird will attack its reflection, and they're often relentless and often very, very annoying. Um, these types of collisions can really only be prevented by entirely blocking out the bird's reflection, um, and uh, then eventually Eventually, it will stop trying to attack its reflection and move on. Um, the second type of collision is really the collision that I'm going to be focused on today. Um, this is when a bird sees um, reflection of habitat or habitat through a pane of glass and flies full speed into that pane of glass, um, often resulting in serious, serious injury or death. This is our focus tonight. All right, so why are collisions a problem? Um, a lot of people have experienced the death of a bird from a window collision, and often it kind of seems like a one-off issue. Um, it's really sad for that individual bird, but maybe it doesn't really seem like it's that big of a conservation issue. In fact, in a 2014 study led by Dr. Scott Loss at the Smithsonian, um, they were able to estimate that 500 million to a billion birds die every year from collisions with windows. So that makes it the second largest form of direct mortality for birds in North America, second only to free roaming cats, or sorry, in the US, second only to free roaming um, and feral cats. It's been nearly 10 years since this study was done, um, and we've continued to develop both our urban and suburban and our, even our rural areas with construction that uses huge expanses of glass, meaning that we're probably likely at the upper end of that 500 million to a billion range, if not surpassing it at this point. So beyond the sadness of just an individual bird's death due to a collision with windows, this is a real and a large scale conservation problem. Um, 
This slide, uh, why do we need birds? So if you are joining this webinar tonight, you probably already know why we need birds or you think birds have intrinsic value of their own. Um, and I don't mean to tell you why birds are important, but not everyone thinks that way. And it's always good to know how to explain to other folks why we need birds and why this is important and why should we care about saving them? Uh, because not everybody just necessarily understands how important Important this is intrinsically. Um, one of the most important things we can do to help birds is educate other people on their value. Not just that intrinsic value, but selfish reasons too. Um, birds contribute billions of dollars in ecosystem services to um, people every single year. After a fire burns a forest to the ground, birds are the ones that um, carry seeds and re helps regenerate that forest. They also eat insects that might destroy our crops and carry diseases, and they pollinate the plants and flowers that we rely on for food and other resources. Birding um, and bird watching is also an enormous industry. Um, these folks travel significant uh, distances and invest money in communities to go birding. Um, this is a hobby that translates to investment for lots of communities, um, not just in the US, but worldwide. Um, they spend lots of money on their equipment. Maybe some of you have scopes and binoculars and you know how much they can cost. Um, and so that just translates into jobs and money uh, across the board. So there's a lot riding on birds and it's really important that we protect them, but I'm sure you folks already know all of that. Um, so what do we need to know about collisions in order to prevent them? Well, one of the things I love most about my job is that I'm working on a conservation issue where we pretty much know everything we know need to know in order to stop them. Of course, there's more we can learn about collisions and there's more research that can and will be done. I'm sure we'll learn more, but as of now, we really do know how to stop this. And so my goal and American Bird Conservancy's goal is to get that knowledge into practice. And I love working on this issue because as sad as it is, um, I can see change happening in real time, which is just really cool. All right, so some of the things we know. Why don't we see more carcasses? A lot of folks are like, all right, Caitlin, sure, you 500 million to a billion birds a year. Like, why am I not seeing bird carcasses just littered on the ground everywhere I look? Um, and a lot of people think like, this is a rare occurrence. It has to be. I don't see birds everywhere, dead birds. <laughs> the reason that we don't see a lot of um, collisions is not because they are rare. They are not rare. Scavengers are just very, very efficient. Um, raccoons, cats, rats, other birds will not just pick up injured and dead birds opportunistically, but these animals will learn to stake out buildings that cause lots of collisions and wait for birds to hit so that they can pick up an easy snack. Um, I have heard stories from monitoring programs on the coast where they have to race herring gulls to carcasses. So they'll watch a bird hit and then it's just a race to the bird uh, to pick it up before the herring gull gets there. Um, in cities, there are also lots of cleaning staff and those cleaning staff often remove birds um, before they can be found by volunteers or before they're seen by passerby because it's pretty distressing to see birds. And so a lot of them have actually um, told us that they've been instructed to make sure that they remove these birds um, so that people don't see them. Additionally, not every single bird that hits a building or a window dies in instantly. Um, often we're learning about window collisions through monitoring for dead and injured birds. And this is what I did a lot of in New York City. Um, I ran a lot of volunteer programs where we walked around and we picked up dead and injured birds. And often that's the only way you can learn uh, about how many birds are hitting windows. But recently, um, there was a study where they used cameras and they actually found that 83% of collisions at a suburban home resulted in the bird flying away immediately afterwards. So there was no injured or dead bird to pick up. Now, just because those birds threw, flew away right away doesn't necessarily mean that they survived that collision. It's actually very likely that a lot of those birds didn't make it. They just sort of died away from us so that we didn't have to see them. Um, when I was in New York City, I actually did a study where I placed dead birds around the routes that our volunteers were walking. So I would go out 
in the early hours of the morning with a false bottom paper bag and I would stroll around uh, and I would try uh, not to be seen by security guards, but I would jostle my paper bag and like drop a bird on the ground <laughs> and it was tagged and I would see if the volunteers found it. And we actually found that our volunteers were only picking up about 23% of the birds that were placed on the roof. So we know that most of these birds disappear long before we ever get to them. Right. Make sure if you have questions as I go, again, please put them in the chat. I have it up. So if you've got a question that is um, that I can answer like in the moment, I will definitely try to do it. Otherwise, we'll hold it to the end. But I don't want anyone to forget their question, but definitely put it in the chat. So what species are most at risk? Uh, almost every species out there at some point or another has hit a window. Um, there is a list kept, I believe, by uh, at, Muhlenberg College at the Ecopian Center for Ornithology. And that list is tremendous. Like every species out there has been recorded to have hit a window. But the majority of birds that are killed um, and the majority of birds that you'll find on your monitoring routes, if that's something you do, are songbirds, um, are warblers, sparrows, thrushes, the birds pictured. Um, this is These are the eastern birds pictured here. There's some thrushes, some perulas, some black and white warblers there in that picture. Um, that was my desk one morning when I was working back at New York City Audubon. Um, these are species that migrate long distances between their breeding grounds and their wintering grounds. I know some of you, if you're birders, you're probably excited to see these species starting to come back here soon. Um, spring's a little later out here <laughs> than I'm used to, so I'm very um, much awaiting the arrival of some of these birds. Um, and so they're migrating these long, long distances. They're running the gamut of North America twice a year, often where they spend their winters and their summers, they're in actually pretty rural areas, but along their migration, they're running into highly urbanized areas or even built up suburban and rural areas. Um, and these species migrate at night, um, which can cause some confusion. So for the most part, these birds aren't just like flying into tall buildings that are sticking up during their migration, um, they're colliding their window with windows after they've stopped to rest, um, most often in the early morning hours. There are some instances where usually it's a combination of lights and weather and heavy migration can lead to these big mortality events at certain buildings, and they get huge amounts of publicity. There was one in Texas a couple years ago. There was one in New York City a couple years ago. There was one in Philadelphia, I believe in 2021. Um, and those are primarily nocturnal collisions. So you're getting birds just disoriented and sort of hitting buildings or landing nearby, um, exhausted because they've just been circling and these lights that they've been attracted to. Um, but that doesn't make up the majority of collisions, the sort of day in, day out, just daytime thunk of birds into windows is really is what is adding up to these big mortality estimates. Um, so these are mostly thunk birds, but you might find that if you um, have a bird feeder or a bird feeder near a building that you actually get lots of winter collisions as well. Certain species have been linked to window collisions. I remember my first window collision was a Northern Cardinal. I was eight years old and it hit a picture window in the middle of winter. And I remember my stepmother being like, oh, birds are so dumb. And like now I think back to that <laughs> every day of that, that formative experience um, and how much more I know now. Um, and then we also get some, usually it's a uh, post dispersal of juveniles. So young birds um, will often hit windows at the end of summer. Sometimes you'll see that with birds like swallows, um, for example. So really it can be any bird out there, but we see songbirds a lot. All right. Which building is the most dangerous? Again, associated with what I said before with these big mortality events and all the media surrounding them, you might think that there's this association between high rise buildings and collisions. In fact, almost 50% of all collisions take place at uh, low rise buildings, low rise buildings at homes, like the picture uh, here on the left. Um, 
Almost all the rest take place at mid-rise buildings up to about 11 stories. And only about one or 2% of all collisions take place at high-rise buildings. The individual high-rise buildings themselves can be very dangerous, but there's fewer of them on the landscape. There's really not that many. These mid-rise buildings can kill tons of birds. And there actually are quite a few of those. And then of course our homes might kill a couple birds a year, um, you know, but there's so many of them on the landscape. And if every home across the country is killing a couple birds a year, you can imagine that number adds up very, very quickly. And so it's important that we prevent collisions at every single building we can to try to get that number down overall. Um, are, like I said before, birds aren't necessarily flying into the tops of tall buildings. They're landing in proximity to these buildings, and then they're colliding where they're most active, which is actually at the lower levels of the buildings, usually at about that tree line or below. It's kind of like how people are most um, likely to get into a car accident in the um, like the couple miles closest to your home. Well, it's not because that's the most dangerous, but it's because that's where you're the most active. So this area where birds are active in the vegetation and they're seeking food and shelter, that is where um, a lot of collisions occur. Also glass that reflects that habitat is gonna be what causes a lot of these collisions. All right, whoops, there we go. So can people see glass? Oh, I guess my video isn't really working. Well, I have a funny video here that has like eight pixels left um, because it's been copied so many times um, of glass being cleaned and then people walking into glass. because There is a misconception that we can see glass and birds can't. It turns out people can't see glass either. That's kind of the point of it is to be made to be clear and see through so that we can, you know, see these big vista, vistas outside. Um, we don't actually see clear glass. Instead, we learn about glass as a concept, often when we're very young. Um, I'm curious if any of you have ever run into glass or seen um, a child run into glass. I will say, I know I've heard the story many times about how I hit a sliding glass door as a kid. Um, luckily, the only thing I injured was my ego. I was very embarrassed. Um, but it is very likely um, that at some point or another, you've learned to see glass kind of through trial and error. Okay, so I want to show you a couple of pictures in a row, and I just, okay, someone, so I, I'm glad you're all still there. I see someone has shared, yes, I have run into glass. I appreciate the honesty, um, and I have someone else out here with me who has also run into glass. <laughs> um, so, if I show you this first picture, it's impossible for us to tell whether this is a picture of trees, if this is a picture of trees through glass, or if this is a picture of trees reflected in glass. When we back out and I give you some context cues, now you can see that glass is involved somehow. Um, you can see the straight lines from the mullions. You can see a crack. Um, straight lines aren't really in natural. So we've definitely, you, here we can tell glass, glass is involved in some way. And it's only when I back out entirely that you can see now that this is a picture of trees reflected in glass. And that is what I mean when I say that we use cues and architectural cues and things that we've learned to tell where glass is, things that birds can't learn. Um, it might not be mullions, it might be a doorknob. Um, you might see on certain glass windows where there's a big pane, and there's like a small row of etching or stickers. And you know that those aren't gonna be just floating in nothingness, those have to be stuck to something. And so we might, recognize and say, hey, okay, this is a pane of glass. Those are there so that I don't walk into it. If you're a bird and you see that, you can't understand the concept of glass. You just see those etchings as a solid barrier, but you might just fly around them. We'll get into that a little bit more. Birds take what they see literally. The trees that they see in this photograph, they perceive as real trees and they fly to them. This is also what happens when there's vegetation through windows, for example, a glass railing or a skywalk. Birds see trees, they fly to them, and often they're 
very fast. They pick up speed very quickly and often they don't survive the impact. It helps if we want to think about how we can make glass bird friendly, it helps to think a little bit more about how birds see the world versus how humans see the world. So we are primates. Um, we have eyes in front of our head, like this cute little primate here on the left. Um, we have good depth perception. We see the world, presumably, you know, we see the world as something in front of us, something that we are moving into. Birds, on the other hand, have eyes on the sides of their head. They don't see the same thing with each eye and they have this big beak in front of them um, and not great 3D vision. They presumably experience the world as something they are immersed in and moving through instead of something that they are focused on directly in front of them. Um, and so my boss, our um, director of our collisions program, Dr. Chris Shepard, uh, likes to use uh, the, her model is a kid texting on a skateboard as how birds are kind of moving through. And if you want that kid to stop, you kind of got to like flag it down and make a big scene in order for it to, you know, the child to pick up their head and notice what's in front of it and divert. And that's kind of what we're trying to do with birds when we put markers on windows that they can see so that they avert and go the other way. And so we use these visual markers that birds see as solid to make glass bird friendly. And we often, we think about it as like, where, what are these markers? We're going to put this on the glass. What are the markers? What is, uh, what does the marker look like? What color is it? How bright is it? All these things are very important, but the spacing between the markers is often what's very important to birds. So it's not just the marker itself, but the spacing that's super important. That's because birds are going to see the markers on the glass as a solid barrier. But remember when I said, if you have a big expanse of glass with a single thing on it, birds are not going to be like, oh, that must be stuck to something. So I better avoid the whole area. Birds are going to think that is solid, but that it's hanging and it exists in space alone and that it can just go around that marker to either side. And so that's why the spacing of our markers is imp important. Birds need to not they need to think that they cannot fit between those markers. And they have very accurate knowledge of how big their bodies are and how wide their wingspans are. And many species, you can imagine these songbirds are often forest birds. They can fit into really tight spaces and maneuver through them. Um, and so birds very much know exactly where they can fit. So we base our spacing guidelines on the body dimensions of the smallest birds. Um, so this used to be called the two by four rule that um, things should be spaced two inches apart. Um, uh, sorry, it, now I can't even remember what the two by four, four rule was. Uh, it used to be that things should be spaced two inches apart vertically, but four inches apart horizontally. And while that does work for a lot of birds, um, the smallest of birds will still think that they can fit in between that four inch spacing. And so now we recommend a two by two inch spacing because that protects the smallest birds and therefore anything bigger. Um, so if you can imagine hummingbirds, kinglets, tiny little birds can think they can think they can fit in tiny little spaces. So our two by two rule markers should be spaced about two inches apart, both horizontally and vertically. Of course, the markers themselves do still need to be visible. So the lines, we found that the lines should be about one eighth of an inch or larger in width. Um, it's cool though. I mean, uh, one eighth of an inch is actually fairly thin. So you don't have to have huge chunky stripes. You can have a fairly thin line as long as the spacing is right. And that allows you to cover less of your glass, but still have the right spacing. Um, dots should be about a quarter of an inch in diameter in order to make sure that birds can see it. Um, we've also found that irregular patterns tend to work really well. So you can have, you know, lots, lines of dots and lines of stripes, but if your spacing is right, you can actually get really creative. And we've found that those irregular patterns work quite well. So what's a bird friendly building? Um, I'm not gonna go too much in depth in this. Um, this is just a little chunk of the kind of lecture that we would usually give for an architect or a developer. Um, and our focus today isn't necessarily commercial buildings and how to design them, um, but I do wanna touch on it because a lot of folks think that bird friendly buildings have to be like windowless and ugly. Um, 
The building on the left is not bird friendly. This is all glass building that reflects the vegetation. It honestly looks like a little bit of a death trap for birds. Um, but many people, especially the architects we work with, think that to be bird friendly, the building has to look like the building on the right. And that is not the case. Um, in reality, we can build really incredible buildings. Um, they can be beautiful and interesting, and they don't necessarily just require swapping out regular glass, regular glass for bird friendly glass. Um, they can incorporate all sorts of de design features that reduce collisions. Um, for example, this New York Times building here has screening on it. Um, there are window shades and louvers on the building on the right. So all kinds of really cool things that make beautiful, interesting buildings that are also bird friendly. Um, if you want to design a bird friendly glass box, you can do it. Uh, this is the Intuit headquarters in Mountain View, California, which requires bird friendly uh, building design. Um, so there's a narrow, narrow horizontal frit stripe that they chose on this glass. It allows views out of the building. If you're far enough away from the building in the parking lot, you can't see at all. But if you're a bird and you get within six to 10 feet of that glass, you can see that line in time. You think, oh, I can't fit between that spacing and you have time to change direction and avert a collision. Um, this is another example. Um, this building has a vertical stripe that also reduces glare inside the building, which is pretty cool. Um, this is kind of a weird looking building. I, if I do say so myself, um, it wasn't designed for birds, but it has this really cool sunshade that um, actually just kind of reduces the amount of glass that birds are exposed to overall. Um, there's lots of overlap between strategies that control for heat and light and strategies that make a building bird friendly, um, which is also very cool. Okay, um, if you're interested, oh wow, this is not a great picture. I'm going to have to get a new one. Um, if you're interested in bird-friendly building design from a commercial perspective, um, this is available on our website. It's a bird-friendly building design guidelines handbook. We have tons of other information and I'll put a couple links in the chat at the end, including one um, to our architecture courses as well. Um, we do teach classes to architects. So if you know of any architecture firms who might be interested, um, we've done a lot of these classes on the coast and we're just starting to do more classes in sort of the Midwest and the Western portion of the country. Um, so if you have any leads on architects who might, in, you know, benefit from having a class on how to design bird friendly buildings, please let us know. Um, and we do offer that. All right. So how do we know what materials are bird friendly? Um, and this is kind of relates to a question that was asked in the very beginning, which is like, what's the most bird friendly? How do we even know this? Um, so one of the ways that we determine whether a material is bird friendly or not is through our tunnel testing program. Um, in the early 2000s, uh, Martin Rosler, who is a European scientist, created this first tunnel to, to, te to test proposed solutions to bird collisions on freestanding highway noise barriers. That was like where the issue was identified early on. Um, American Bird Conservancy created two tunnels using a second generation version of his design um, in 2009, and our second one actually just now in 2021. Tunnel testing, um, we call this a non-injurious -injur standardized uh, binary choice test that uses wild songbirds to determine the effectiveness of different patterns. And so this is our newest tunnel, which is located on the Eastern shore of Maryland. Um, both of these tunnels are uh, located at ba bird banding stations. So we use wild songbirds. Um, and let me go to the next slide and see if it has better. Yeah, here we go. Um, so the wild birds are caught. Uh, they are banded and processed at the banding station as normal. And if they are the right size and healthy and flying well, um, they come over to the tunnel to take a flight down the tunnel before they get released. So they get put in this end of the tunnel over here on the right side. There's a little hole here and a camera that we use to record the flight. And we put the bird in the tunnel. And what the bird sees is this picture here in the middle. On one side of the tunnel is a control pane of clear glass. On the other side is the pattern that we're testing. 
in between the birds and the glass is a very fine nest net that keeps them from hitting that glass. So they will fly down the tunnel and decide which way they wanna go. And essentially the more birds that choose to go to the control and away from this pattern, the more likely, the more we think that that glass is bird friendly, that birds are seeing that pattern and choosing to go away from the glass. Um, and we run lots of controls and we switch the panes back and forth and, and do lots of testing. Um, we run at least 80 flights and essentially we use the number of birds that fly uh, away from the, the test pane to determine a threat factor score and that glass re receives a score. Threat factors aren't necessarily a guarantee that a glass is gonna do like really well and eliminate all collisions in the real world, but it's sort of an index that gives us a relative um, measure of how bird friendly that glass is. Um, you know, different glass is always going to perform differently depending on the exact situation that it's installed in. But this gives us a pretty good idea of how well that glass will perform to prevent collisions. So uh, we actually have a whole database of products that have been tested. I will drop that link in the chat later on. I don't, I can't access the link right now. I'm afraid if I click on it that I will accidentally make my presentation go away, but I will certainly <laughs> drop that link in um, when we're finished. Um, and you can see all of the products that we have tested thus far and architects can use that to uh, determine uh, which uh, products they might wanna use in a new building. All right. So making your community safer for birds. We know collisions are bad. We know we wanna prevent them. We know how to prevent them, but how do we actually get this into our communities? Um, well, the first thing you can do is start at home. Um, it's always good to start at your home near any windows where you've heard or seen a bird hit, um, any windows near feeders or fruit trees or any windows where vegetation is reflected, or if you have like a big potted plant behind glass, birds might try to fly to it. So those are kind of your priority uh, windows for fixing. Um, there's been a huge um, emphasis recently on creating backyard habitat for birds. Um, I have a bird feeder. Um, if I owned my home, I would love to plant native plants in it. Hopefully sometime in the future, <laughs> I'll be able to do that. But it's important that if we're creating habitat for birds in our backyards, that we're also making sure that our windows are safe and not uh, we're not luring them in uh, to a trap essentially. So this is kind of where your priority should be. And there's tons of options and I'm gonna go through them and I'm gonna go through them relatively quickly, but we, I can answer questions about them and we have a whole website that lists all of these options that I will share with you later so you don't have to memorize all the different options. Um, all One note is that all of these do need to go on the exterior of your windows. This is because if you have a reflective window that obscures or that reflects habitat, the reflections are coming off of the glass on the exterior of your windows. And if you put a product on the inside, that reflection will obscure that product. So you, in order to break up reflection, you really do need the product on the outside of your windows. And often um, window washers and maintenance people are willing to do the installation of these products if you can't uh, reach your windows easily from the exterior. All right, so let's start with the easy thing. Uh, insect screens. All of my windows at my house have insect screens, so I know that they're bird friendly and um, it's a really easy uh, external insect, insect screens provide a little bit of a padding and they obscure that reflection. Um, here is a lovely bird friendly uh, window with a bird friendly indoor cat in it as well. Uh, <laughs> uh, that window has an external paint uh, pattern on it. Here's a great two other examples that are way beyond um, my personal level of creativity, but these are incredible examples of uh, tempera and acrylic paint used on the exterior of windows to be bird friendly. Uh, you don't need to get this fancy. Um, you can just do lines, dots, stripes, whatever, squiggles uh, in a two by two inch pattern. Actually, okay, these are a little more within the realm of what I think I could do with tempera paint. Um, there's even little sponge paint markers you can use and just paint right on the outside. This is also a great solution um, for kids to participate in, especially if you've got collisions at a school um, and you can just wash these off and redo them whenever they kind of start to fade. Um, and I really love um, 
I love this solution for kids especially. Um, you can also not just use paint uh, individually, but there are rollers that have different patterns. So as long as the roller pattern itself has the right spacing, you can just roll the pattern right on those windows. This is at the North Carolina Zoo. Great example of using paint uh, to good effect. Um, ABC bird tape. So ABC bird tape uh, was available for a while and then was gone and is now being relaunched uh, through the company Feather Friendly. So you can pre-order it now. It'll be up very, very soon. Bird tape is available. Um, bird tape comes in squares or rolls of stripes um, and you can put it up on your windows in a pattern, any pattern you like. If you want to make a cool giraffe, you can cut it out. As long as you're making sure that spacing is two by two inches, um, you can use any pattern you want and bird tape is pretty easy to put up it it actually lasts a long time it will last several years um, so you won't have to redo this regularly so that's bird tape decals there are so many different brands of decals if you search collision prevention you'll probably get an amazon link to a bunch of different decals um, decals can work really well again as long as they're on the outside of the window and spaced appropriately so they can be all different shapes um, they can be uh, different sizes the decals seen here are actually quite large and so that's where i find turns people off of using decals is that often the decals that come are quite large, but then if your spacing needs to be two by two inches, you're ending up covering a ton of your window. So some people have bought decals and they're like, oh no, I didn't realize I need this spacing and I don't have enough. And I'm like, hey, your lines only need to be an eighth of an inch. Your dots only need to be a quarter of an inch in diameter. Take that decal and just cut it up into little pieces and then spread it out over your window um, and you can accomplish the same effect um, with less coverage of your windows and it will still work really well. And of course, um, this is a great example place to say, and I think this myth about collisions has really been dispelled mostly, but some folks still think if you put a raptor silhouette in the middle of your window, it'll work. Um, Birds will not avoid, um, they might avoid that silhouette, but again, they're just going to fly to one side or the other. They, they're not going to think that it's a real raptor that they should avoid, or if they do, that's not going to last long. Um, and so again, that's where I tell people to cut it up into little pieces and spread it out across their window. Um, and so decals can be done really well. Um, a copian bird savers is a great option. One thing to note about a copian bird savers is that because they are 3D and off the window, and sorry, I should say, these are essentially parachute cords that are strung and hang in front of your windows. Um, so it's really cool. You can just kind of put them on the outside of your windows hanging down. Uh, they're also known as Zen window curtains. Um, because they're 3D and off the window and maybe have some movement, these can actually be spaced four inches apart and be entirely effective. So um, I know a lot of people hear two by two spacing and then see the Ecopian bird savers and think, oh, that won't work. Um, these do work in the four inch spacing. Um, you can buy buy them um, from their website, or you can make them on your own out of parachute cord. And on the website, they have instructions. Um, this company is really just focused on, um, you know, making sure that birds aren't colliding with windows. So they have instructions on how to make your own. Also a great DIY project for a nature center for kids to take part in. Um, this is a really great option. Um, bird crash preventers are essentially um, fishing line. Um, so these are essentially, um, you know, again, thin in front of the windows can work fairly well um, as well. So bird crash preventers. Um, and of course, because fishing line is so thin and not very visible, um, you really, your view out is not obscured in any way. Um, easy up shades are screening essentially for uh, sun and they go as long as they're on the exterior of your windows, these of course will prevent collisions really well. Um, bird screen is another product as long as it's essentially a screen you can see that obviously um, 
it does go in front of your window, but when you're back out, um, I believe, uh, I have a question, which is, can the fishing line be four inches apart like the Ocopian bird savers? I believe, and I will try to find out this information, you can look at bird crash preventers. They're advertised in the correct spacing. I believe they do need to be closer together because they are so fine and like practically un invisible, whereas the Ocopian bird savers are a little bit bigger and more obvious. Um, that's a great question. Um, Bird screen, um, you can see through it, but it kind of uh, shades your windows a little bit. Again, as long as it's on the outside of your window, this works great. Um, window films, so there are a couple different um, options for window films, which include the product Solex, uh, Kaleidoscape is another brand that has a couple different options. These are films that need to be gone on the exterior of your windows. Um, they have lines, they have dots, they have all kinds of different patterns, whatever floats your boat. Some companies um, can even make your own um, you know, patterns, uh, so really cool options. Um, yeah, and these are films, again, that go on the outside of your window, they cover the whole window. Um, these might, you can you can do DIY install on these. Personally, I think I'd wanna get a professional to do them for me because I get tons of bubbles in there, but uh, I've been told that this could be DIY too. Um, feather friendly is a great option as well. So feather friendly goes up like a window film, but then the backing peels off and it essentially just leaves behind little vinyl dots. Um, feather friendly has a couple different options, including um, basically a tape that just has like a row of dots. And so you put up the dots, you can put up a strip and then you peel it off and it leaves the dots. And then you go two inches and you put up a strip and they have a new product um, that actually puts uh, like six of those rows together. So you can kind of do bigger sections of your window at a time. Um, feather friendly is a great option. Again, views out are great. Um, I actually like the look of the dots on the windows. I th don't think it takes away from the aesthetics of the building at all. Um, very cool. Oh, and it looks like Boise has a nature center with these dots on it that you can go see in person, which is awesome. It's always great for people who are skeptical to take them somewhere where one of these products is installed and they'll be like, oh, that's not bad at all. So I highly recommend it if you have the option to take a skeptic out to see them. Uh, let's see, um, Bird Divert is a new product. So Bird Divert is uh, their 3 8 inch uh, UV absorbing dots spaced uh, and UV reflective dots kind of alternating. Um, Bird Divert is a UV product. Birds, most birds can see UV that we can't see. Um, and so UV patterns are really popular because we can't see them as well as birds can for the most part. One thing to note about UV patterns is that UV, um, not all birds can see UV. So uh, raptors and doves and pigeons can't see in the UV. So this is not going to prevent collisions from those birds. But if you have a location where the majority of the collisions are songbirds, this could be a good option. Also, uh, in order to reflect or absorb UV, there has to be UV light. So um, we found that in practice, these products products don't necessarily work quite as well in shady locations. I wouldn't recommend a UV product in a very shaded uh, location. I would be afraid that it might not get enough UV light to actually be effective. Um, but it has been shown to be effective in several applications, and we're pretty excited about this because this is a really good product for people who just are not willing to have something visible up on a window. Um, Kaleidoscape White is an option. Kaleidoscape is a window film. Uh, you end up being able to see out. People can't see in. So um, aesthetically, this may or may not be what a building wants to go for, but it's very much highly uh, effective. External motorized shades are a great option. Of course, they only work when they're down, um, but these can work really, really well um, if you keep them down during the times when birds are most likely to collide with windows. Um, netting is an option. I generally don't recommend netting, um, though it has been installed in a couple of locations and been really effective. Um, netting works uh, essentially to, but it's both visible, but it also kind of just provides a uh, soft uh, landing for birds. Um, the problem is that sometimes it can get loose. If it's not maintained really well, birds can get stuck behind it, um, which can kill them. So it 
you really need to be up on your maintenance on this. But as long as the maintenance is done, this can be really effective and these installations can last a long time. So they are definitely an option. So um, we have a flyer up in several languages available on our website. And this link I am going to put in the chat at the end. This is our uh, home collisions website. This is a relatively new website um, with new content that we've created, basically to have all of these products available for you, along with the spacing recommendations and other information to make it really easy. Um, this will be continually updated. Um, it just went live a couple weeks ago, so we will certainly have updates to it in the future. All right, so beyond your own home, um, making your own, your community safer for birds. Um, there's a lot of things that you can, you can do. Um, the first, of course, is to get involved in local efforts. And I did a Google search that was like, uh, window collisions, uh, Idaho and to see what I could find, which is uh, one of them as a lights out program. Um, so you can get involved in lights out efforts. I'll talk about lights out a little more. Um, collision monitoring, of course. Um, I have uh, worked with volunteers on collision monitoring um, since I was in grad school and it is really rewarding. Um, it is, can be really difficult sometimes to be the person that's monitoring these buildings and finding these birds. But when you actually have a success story, when you get a building retrofit, when you get legislation passed, it, it really makes it all worth it. Um, but some folks um, are not cut out for collision monitoring. And I also respect, totally respect that. Uh, there's often lots of other advocacy opportunities such as letter writing campaigns, um, providing testimony for bills. So lots of different options. Um, I recommend looking, of course, for your local Audubon chapter like Golden Eagle Audubon. Um, ornithological societies, university programs. There are lots of bird clubs and lots of university students are starting uh, similar programs on their campuses. Um, so lots of options out there. Um, you can also report any collisions you see, if you're not, even if you're not a collision monitor, to one of these three different collision reporting programs. Um, iNaturalist, if you have iNaturalist and an iNaturalist account, there's a dead bird um, uh, program that you can report dead birds to. Um, D-Bird is an option. Full disclosure, I helped work on D-Bird when I was at New York City Audubon. Um, and D-Bird doesn't require an account. It works anywhere. You just go to dbird.org and snap a picture and you can upload it. And then if anybody wants to um, you know, get uh, collision data from any region or area, they'll get your report. Um, and then the Global Bird Collision Mapper is based out of FLAP uh, Canada, which is one of the very first programs that ever did any of this. Um, and it also works in the US, not just in Canada. Um, so you don't have to be a collision monitoring uh, monitor in order to help report collisions. Um, often there are a couple different community goals when communities want to reduce collisions. Fixing existing buildings, we call those retrofits, preventing new bad buildings, and lights out. So I'm going to talk about all these approaches, um, and I'm going to actually start with number three, which is lights out. Um, lights out for birds during migration is really important, not just for collisions. I mean, lights... Um, the direct correlation or the cause of like light can cause collisions, but light also attracts birds into areas where they're more at risk for collisions during the day. Um, so, and light just screws with birds migration. It also messes with all kinds of other wildlife. It also messes with insects and can be, has been shown to be linked to insect reduction, which is the food for a lot of our birds. Like light is just all around not great artificial light at night. Um, and so often organizations will do lights out for birds during migration. You could do voluntary programs where you ask buildings to participate. Um, you can get proclamations from city leaders um, and they will have city buildings turn their lights out for birds. Usually it's during migration from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. about, um, depends on the city. Um, you can advocate for fixture changes. So these can be voluntary or legislative. Um, Dark Skies International uh, has great resources on Lights Out. I highly recommend. This is a really cool figure, I think, as to showing what's an unacceptable light fixture, uh, what's still bad, still bad, 
fully shielded fixtures are really the best option. And of course, being off most of the time with a timer or a motion sensor is great. Um, I will say that if you're getting collisions at your home, turning your lights off are, is probably not the best way to prevent collisions. Um, home collisions tend to be daytime collisions more so than anything, but turning your lights out is good for everyone. You know, it's good for people, it's good for birds, it's good for other wildlife. So highly recommend it no matter what, even if it's not directly reducing collisions in, in that context. So fixing existing buildings. Um, if there is a building that you think or know is bad in your community, um, we generally recommend fixing, identifying priority windows and leaving the rest. While we'd love to fix every single window, we've gotta be pragmatic and recognize that it does cost money and it does take effort. Um, and so the goal should really be to fix the worst and leave the rest. So the basic steps to getting a retrofit in place include step one, um, pay attention. Monitoring and showing data is always good. Um, most of the buildings where uh, I or the organization I've worked with have been effective in getting a retrofit up um, has we've shown them data. Um, there have been a couple, though, where they're like, oh, no, we know this is a problem. We've seen the birds like, OK, help us fix it. So you don't always need data, but it can help. Um, having data can also help you prioritize specific facades. So this is an example where the Chicago bird collision monitors and my colleague uh, Brian Lenz work together. And if you look at this this one in the middle, this Allen Center, 50%, nearly 50% of all the collisions took place in just this one little area right here. So if money was an issue, if they didn't really want to put uh, things up, I would prioritize this over any of these other facades. The last thing you want to do is waste your time and money on places that aren't killing as many birds. Of course, we'd like to fix it all, but that can't always happen. Um, and then the next step, whoops, sorry, I lost my, my train of thought, um, plan for a solution or advocate for one. So I went through a lot of solutions, but there's a lot more in organizations like Golden Eagle Audubon and like, uh, American Bird Conservancy are here to help find a solution to advocate for. Um, and then you're going to advocate for retrofit. Um, this often takes education of people who don't really know anything about collisions. It takes a lot of persistence and we have a guide online that is available uh, to help you uh, plan your advocacy around getting a retrofit in place. Um, most building owners have never even thought about this issue before. So what we found is that kind of going in as a friend with an offer to help is the best option for getting those done. And I realize it's almost eight o'clock, so um, I will go through these next things so we can get to questions. But uh, I wanted to give a couple success stories. Um, this is a railing in New York City. This wasn't even a railing we monitored. It was one that one of our volunteers just happened to walk by every day and started realizing was a problem and started picking up birds. Um, and we went to uh, the organization that runs this campus and they had feather friendly dots up in three days. I was shocked at the speed of their reply. They really just didn't know it was a problem. And as soon as we brought it to their attention, they were like, okay. Um, this is in contrast to other buildings that I, um, we started collecting data on maybe six or seven years ago, and they are just starting to test different films. So persistence is key. You get some success stories like this that just work out. And for sometimes you just got to keep really working. So don't get discouraged if, if a building owner or a building is not immediately amenable um, to your suggestions. Another success story, this is at UW-Madison. This was led by Madison Audubon and a team um, from the university, as well as some other folks. Um, they had monitoring at this building, um, which really like funneled birds into the glass. And you can see that this building now has Feather Friendly up. And I thought they did a really cool thing, which is that they put a QR code up about bird window collisions in the study. So this QR code, people could look at these dots and be like, what are these dots? And scan it and learn more about bird collisions and the program and why those dots were there. I thought that was a really awesome idea. 
Another success story out of Portland, Oregon. I had nothing to do with this one, but I've read the report on it. Um, they had a great monitoring program at a building um, that was then retrofit. This is a product called Solix. This is a window film. Um, and they have a full report on their website um, that showed a 94% decrease at this city building after a retrofit. And they go through all of the work they did to collect data um, and really it's very detailed and very helpful. So I highly recommend checking out Portland Audubon um, and one of their success stories here. Uh, new construction. You can also advocate for new construction to be bird friendly. This is the fifth, this is the Milwaukee Buck Stadium. Um, very time consuming. It can be a great, uh, they can be very successful and helpful from the perspective of like press and fanfare. I will say um, this stadium is bird friendly because our colleague Brian worked on it for over three years. So it does take a lot of effort, which is why we often recommend targeting multiple buildings through ordinances and guidelines versus working on each building one at a time. Um, and this involves building a coalition, um, knowing your ask, being patient. Um, you can do this without a law. Um, universities adopt guidelines for all the buildings on their campuses, parks, departments, businesses, departments of transportation, architecture firms will adopt guidelines for all the buildings they build moving forward. Um, and so you can, you don't need legislation to get guidelines adopted. And this often just requires working with these organizations um, and helping them figure out what their guidelines are going to be and advocating for them. Um, and then, of course, you can also adopt an ordinance or a law. Um, ABC has an entire website with the tools to help folks do this, including a model ordinance with fairly strong language um, that is a great starting point, but can also a guide for walking that back and compromising. Um, we have reviews of existing ordinances and guidelines that currently exist and which we recommend and why. Um, we do recommend starting with that model ordinance if you're going for legislation. Um, we have tips for building public support, um, specific tools for lead credit, and um, we have some information on New York City's guidelines which is the current most strict guidelines, uh, mandatory ordinance in the country. Um, and these are all the other laws that have been passed. And there's actually a couple new ones that I need to add. Washington, D.C. just passed legislation. Um, so there's been more and more uh, coming up and uh, American Bird Conservancy, we really are here to help uh, with anyone who is interested in getting guidelines, both, uh, you know, guidelines for universities, parks, but also policy and, and other ordinances passed. So sorry, that was a little bit of a word salad. But my my point being, ABC is here to help. Um, if you are working on something and you want help figuring out what to recommend, if you want help figuring out what language to use, if you want uh, someone to sit there and shake and nod their head and be an expert and just provide support in a meeting for you. Um, if you are, uh, you know, any kind of work that you're trying to get done, we're here to help. We have all those resources. I'll drop all those links in the chat. Um, and you can also reach out to us. My colleague Aniko is on here too. Um, because I usually give this presentation alongside her, um, but you are welcome to reach out to us if you need anything. Um, and with that, I am happy I'm going to stop sharing my screen uh, so that I can drop some of these links in the chat and I would love to answer any questions you might have. And in the meantime, we let me get some some of these uh, links in the chat too. <laughs> okay, you, can, you get the links in the chat, everybody put your questions in. I know there's a couple that are still pending. Um, um, but I put in the chat that if you uh, join Golden Eagle Audubon tonight at, at any level, if you're a new member, we will provide you with um, this. Let's see, you know, he's using the camera. There we go. Can you see that? Feather friendly. Of course you can buy this product too, but, but we'll give you, we'll send you one of these if you want one. It's a hundred feet. So join tonight online www.goldeneagleaudubon.org. And then uh, we also are um, putting together a team. Um, uh, let, me, let me first give a, a big hats off. Golden Eagle Audubon has done tremendous work on this, um, on this issue before I came along. 
And there's some of the people on this call tonight spent many, many hours monitoring at the Hall of Mirrors, that building that's on across State Street from the uh, Idaho State House, that big mirrored building. And we have all that data and we just uh, were collecting the data and hadn't started our, hadn't made good plans for, well, how are we gonna use that now to uh, get the state to retrofit that building? Um, uh, so if you wanna help make that happen, um, send me, email me, lpaul at goldeneagleaudubon.org. We also um, were out at the Bound Crossing Library where the librarians uh, were like totally on board. And we had the city manager, building manager out there too, who didn't know anything about how to make things bird friendly. Uh, but they had tons of birds. One day it was just like nonstop birds hitting their windows. So um, uh, we're very lucky that we have a, a, a so there's some great information, resource people, uh, Denez from, um, Idaho Fishing Game was there that day. And then she went over to BSU and uh, the next week or a couple of weeks later and um, and had their buildings engineer come to one of the buildings that where there was bird strikes being reported. And um, and the and the facilities manager went back and ordered all the products that day. And maybe they're even up by now. So as Caitlin says, if you have somebody who's like, wow, I had no idea. Oh, and look at I can just order these products and our staff can put them up even on the highest buildings, uh, highest windows and stuff. I mean, I'll, although she says you don't need to go super high. Um, so let me know. We're looking for people who, but we're also just looking for people who want to um, uh, help us create some displays, help us create some educational materials, you know, make sure that we're putting things into our social media feed and stuff like that, because obviously uh, there's a lot of interest in this. So. Are you looking at the chat now, Caitlin? Why don't you go ahead and ask am. All right. Um, there's a really good question about the different reporting databases and whether they talk to each other. Um, as of now, they don't talk to each other directly, though there are some researchers that are looking at compiling data from them um, and doing some kind of big data analysis all uh, on all of those data because they all are publicly accessible. You can go download data from them. Um, they don't talk to each other right now. The reason all three exist is mainly because they each serve a little bit of a different purpose. Um, for example, DBIRD was created because we were finding that people were kept from um, uh, reporting because they didn't want to make an account on iNaturalist or the Global Bird Collision Mapper. Um, so these are kind of people who are reporting incidental collisions and maybe they're not super invested. And that step to creating an account uh, was too much for them. And we wanted to capture those. So DBIRD is really good at capturing those sort of incidental collisions, whereas iNaturalist is great for um, you know, if you want to crowdsource IDs, it really works well for that one. And if you like to use an ArcGIS interface, the Global Bird uh, Collision Mapper is really good for that. So they all kind of serve different purposes and we haven't figured out exactly how to get them all to talk to each other, but there are scientists sort of working on um, putting those data all together and, and uh, at least using it to look at some big picture questions uh, that they can all help us learn. Um, so that's a great question. Uh, I, there was another question um, about uh, birds hitting windows in the fall when they're eating soft berries uh, and berries on a flowering pear tree um, and that they might be fermented and the birds might be drunk. Um, this is a good question that I actually don't have a definitive answer for because I've also heard that this happens, especially with um, cedar wax wings, for example. But I've also seen people um, debunk this claim and say that that actually doesn't really happen or isn't super common. I know that often cedar waxwings will all, and other birds uh, like them, bohemian waxwings, all of a sudden you'll see like a ton of them dead at one time um, near a tree. And it isn't actually that they were drunk and sort of flying wrong. It's that they all got scared at the same time or they, they tend to be um, a flocking bird and they really move fast together as a flock. And so when they hit, they like all hit the window at the same time. I'd recommend giving a window collision treatment a try, maybe something that's a little bit on the cheaper side, like um, paint, for example, um, and give it a try and see if it works, because even if they are 
drunk from fermented berries, I would expect that a bright, you know, a bright white stripe or paint would still keep them maybe from hitting the window. So I would at least give a collision deterrent a try in that location and see how it works. Let's see. Anything else? Oh, this is a great question that I did not talk about. When a bird hits a window and is injured and doesn't fly off, what is the best thing to do? Um, we used to tell people to uh, put the bird in a paper bag. Um, a paper bag is a great bird transport, by the way, <laughs> as an aside, great bird ambulance, a, an appropriate size unwaxed paper bag, because if you put a bird in it um, and it jumps around in there, uh, it won't hurt itself further. And this especially applies to birds that have a tendency to go straight up like American woodcocks. If you put them in a box, sometimes they'll further injure themselves by continuing to jump straight up. So. Um, we usually say put the bird in a bag and then let it rest for a bit and release it. But in the last couple of years, rehabilitation centers have found that birds do much, much better if they're able to get anti-inflammatories pretty early on in the time after they've hit the window. However, I recognize that not everybody lives anywhere near a rehabilitation center. I used to have trouble getting people to travel 30 minutes to a rehab center. And I have now a friend in Wyoming and the nearest rehabber to them is like two and a half hours away. So um, if you have a rehab center, a rehabilitation center near you, and usually your state's fish and game um, department or whatever the equivalent is, will have a list of them. Get the bird there as soon as possible. Give them a call, get advice from them, but generally they're going to want to see it. If you don't have access to one, putting the bird in a safe, dark place to rest is your best bet. Not giving it food or water and just giving it a safe place to kind of recover. And then if you hear the bird sort of hopping around in there, it might be ready to release and you can take the bag outside and open it and release the bird. So uh, for the most part, these birds are suffering from bruising and sort of uh, traumatic brain injuries and some of them can recover from it, but treatment is always the best option. Earlier on, we had a question about washing windows. Obviously, paint mm. would wash off. I mean, people like to wash the insides and the outsides of their windows. How about uh, feedback on any of those other products and uh, that are applied to the outside? Yeah, all of the other products, bird tape, feather friendly, kaleidoscape, films, all of them hold up to window washing just fine. Paint is really the one where window washing is gonna take it off and you're gonna have to redo it. Um, a copian bird saver is you can just like move them out of the way. Um, depending on how you install the fishing line, you can just move that out of the way. So, um, but all those adhesive products are made to stand up to, you know, window washing and to the weather. Yeah. Oh, it looks like this is a good question for you. I don't know the answer to this one. Does Boise have a rehab center for songbirds? Uh, we do have an, a bird rehab center. Can somebody type in the chat the name of it? It's the one, um, I think, up by Hillside Junior High. Um, yeah, thanks, Meg. Ruth Melkor Bird Rehab. And they do. In fact, I think I just saw social media where they had a vulture in there this this um, winter, and they just it just got released. It has recuperated from whatever injury it had. Anyway, so thanks, Cindy, for asking that question. Um, and of course, they're not, you know, they're they're underfunded and they're not there all the time, all the time and everything. But um, that certainly is good to know. Hey, you guys, let's give it up for uh, Caitlin. What an absolutely information packed uh, presentation and well, well presented, clear, kept our kept us on the edge of our seats. Um, <laughs> And certainly no shortage of um, options for what we can do at our own homes. I mean, that is that is truly amazing, all those products. And um, so everybody take a few minutes and, um, you know, uh, open up some of those, uh, use those links, open up some of those things and um, what do you call it? Bookmark those on your um, browser so you can get back there and, and look at them again. And uh, again, if you... Um, absorb some of this and now you're ready to help other people. I thought at the very beginning when Caitlin was saying, people just need to understand, you know, why birds are important and that just because they don't see dead birds piling up in these huge mounds outside every building doesn't mean that it's not a serious problem because it is a very, very serious problem. And there's, and it's a problem that can so easily uh, be solved. And I'm, I'm really curious to know 
um, what ideas you have for what Golden Eagle Audubon can do um, on education and, and advocacy. All right, let's give it up. Yay. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you all for asking such great questions and being so engaged. It's great. That's super. Well, we hope this spring comes and our spring migrants come back. And I will get this posted up on our on our YouTube channel and send out uh, that link to you guys through the uh, uh, through the uh, Eventbrite that you signed up with. All right, everybody, have a great rest of your evening and take care out there. Bye, hey, everyone. Have a good night. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks, Caitlin. <laughs>